1967 was a steel frame building and it's the first steel frame building that has collapsed due to fire. The failure of the building was an implosion. It failed completely different than towers one and two in which the floors failed first. Why building seven? Let's ask the question again. As the WTC command center, was it the hub for the 9-11 plan? Also, in six and a half seconds, lost forever were thousands of SEC case files on corporate fraud, including those relating to the notorious activities of giants WorldCom and Enron. A few indictments for stock fraud, but what of the $70 billion California electricity swindle? It disappeared. No one died in the collapse of Building 7. It was vacated well in advance of its implosion, but not the Twin Towers. Why weren't police, firemen, and civilians in these buildings told what to expect? Tragically, employees in the towers were advised to return to their offices. The announcement came on that everything was fine. Tower 1, they were evacuating, but Tower 2 was fine, and we could go back to our offices. We're about to go to the turnstile. The security guard says, where you guys are going? I said, well, I'm going home because I saw fireballs coming down. He said, no, your building is safe. It's secured. It is safer to stay in your building. Go back to your office. Stanley Priamnath returned to the 81st floor. Then... I just happened to raise my head looking straight towards the Statue of Liberty. And what I saw was a giant airplane coming straight towards me. The South Tower was hit between the 78th and 84th floors. Trapped on the 81st floor by crushing debris, Stanley was rescued by Brian Clark. Slowly and painfully, they made their way down a stairwell to freedom. Outside, Stanley had a feeling of uncanny prescience for what was to come. And we peered through the railing, up through the trees at the tower, and Stanley said, you know, I think that tower could come down. And I don't know why I'm telling this man this building is going. But I knew it was not over. I said, there's no way. That's a steel structure. That's just draperies and carpets and furniture burning. You know, there's no way. And I didn't finish my sentence when the tower started to slide. And I can still remember hearing, first of all, this boom, boom, boom explosion. Not all were blessed with intuition or foresight. Joseph Milanowicz reached his son Greg by cell phone. Greg at that time, um, I could tell by his voice, was scared. Uh, he said to me, uh, Dad, can you get in touch with someone and tell them that there's about 20 of us on the northeast corner of the 93rd floor? Greg had been about to leave the South Tower after the North Tower was attacked, but was told it was safer to return to his desk. A couple of times he said, why did I listen? Why did I listen? Who was a director in the company that provided electronic security for the World Trade Center and Washington's Dulles Airport, both involved in September 11th? None other than the president's younger brother. From 1996 to 2000, SecureCom installed what was referred to as a new security system at the World Trade Center. Wirt D. Walker III, a cousin of the Bush brothers, was CEO of SecureCom from 1999 until 2002. Interestingly, these facts have not been made public. Was it only a security system that was added during those years? Or was it also the wiring for a long-awaited plan? Scott Forbes, an IT specialist in a firm that had leased space in the South Tower since its erection, reported an unprecedented power down in his building for almost the whole weekend prior to 9-11. We were notified three weeks in advance of the power down by the Port Authority. That was relatively short notice 
to plan to shut down all of our banking systems. It was a big deal. It was, a, it was unprecedented. We had a data center on the 97th floor. So our originating servers were all there. During that weekend, the power down meant that there was no security. Uh, the doors were all open, basically. And also the security video cameras were all off. But they were guys in overalls carrying huge toolboxes and wheels of cables walking around the building on that weekend. Employees were notified that internet cables were being upgraded. But who were the strange workmen and what were they really doing? All the power was shut down. If there was a power down, that meant that everything was uh, gone in terms of uh, security, in terms of uh, access to the building. So anybody could have gone there and do any kind of uh, setup. Having worked overtime to get his company's servers back up, Scott took the day off on September 11th. As he watched the towers collapse from New Jersey that morning, he was sure this had been the purpose of the mysterious weekend work. Scott notified many authorities, including the 9-11 Commission, about the unusual and lengthy power outage, but was ignored. Ben Fountain of Fireman's Fund spoke of unusual evacuations ordered at the Twin Towers during the weeks before September 11th. Others reported that the security alert was inexplicably lifted five days prior and bomb-sniffing dogs were removed. What would the dogs have discovered had they remained on duty? Not long after the disaster, Lower Manhattan saw banners like this one. Although they were idolized as cathedral-like symbols of power and triumph that pierced the New York skyline, the Twin Towers were big money losers for the Port Authority of New York. They cost millions a year to equip with the basics, electricity, water, heat, air conditioning, sewage, and even oxygen, being airtight. As modern communications connected traders from all corners of the globe, tenancy in the Twin Towers continued to drop. The towers presented another problem. Decades ago, their steel beams had been sprayed with fireproof asbestos, a cancer-causing material banned from use in building in the mid-1980s. Although the World Trade Center complex was given several waivers, it was expected to clean up its act. But to remove the asbestos from every supporting beam in the Twin Towers would have been almost undoable. Quotes for this cleanup ran over a billion, and no insurance company was willing to bear the cost. An urban renewal project of unfathomable proportions. Given the tower's issues and problems, September 11th proved an unexpected bonanza. The Trade Center was built in the 1960s to revive a rundown area of New York, and 40 years later, urban renewal could again take place. Two white elephants were removed, and a brand new complex is in the works. The full height of the new Freedom Tower will soar to 1,776 feet. The suffocating dust that engulfed Manhattan was much more than dust. It was pulverized concrete, glass, metals, containing lead, mercury, dioxins, benzene, and of course, asbestos. None of that was healthy for any living thing. Today, thousands of rescue workers have developed lung cancer and serious permanent health conditions. And the rescue dogs continue to die. What you had was a ground-level municipal incinerator that smoldered for months, burning up the most heavily computerized building in the world. Patients have had black paste coming out of their pores. They have reported bowel movements that are blue or green and have smelled like smoke, despite the fact that they have not been at a fire scene for months. 
Only three days after September 11th, Washington instructed the EPA to declare Manhattan safe and reopen Wall Street, though the air remained toxic. A federal judge is blasting the former head of the Environmental Protection Agency for telling New Yorkers it was safe to return to their homes and offices near Ground Zero soon after the 9-11 attacks. The judge called Christine Todd Whitman's actions, quote, conscious shocking, and refused to grant her immunity. It was documented that the White House ordered EPA to tell these lies, to downplay the seriousness of the environmental hazards. In addition, 9-11 first responders who have fallen ill and applied for aid have been denied. Asbestos plays a part in the myth of why the Twin Towers fell on September 11th. The steel had been sprayed with a lightweight fireproof foam, which, while cheaper, was much less adhesive. The New York Times has reported that the foam fell off easily and the Port Authority had been fixing and replacing missing sections in the months before September 11th. But even if the fireproofing had been perfectly applied, the impact of the plane crashing into the North Tower was so powerful, it simply blew most of it off, allowing the fire to attack the steel beneath. Once the plane hit, whatever condition it was in uh, before the fact, made no difference because an impact would knock it off and the fire would have devastating effects on the steel. One good smack from a jet plane and the puffs of asbestos are all blown off the steel. Would a few hundred doors slamming do the same thing? Here the History Channel tells us how due to poor fireproofing, flames swept through the pockets between floors. As much of the fireproofing had been dislodged on impact, the flames were attacking unprotected steel. When steel is not protected, the strength reduces very fast. When you get to about 1100 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, you lose about half the strength of the steel. The fire inside the towers may have reached temperatures of 2500 degrees Fahrenheit. The New York Times has reported what happened to those steel floor trusses then. The steel did heat up and it became softer and softer, almost like licorice. And eventually, all the steel had been weakened in this zone. Forty years ago, the steel used to build the World Trade Center was certified by Underwriters Laboratories, a global product compliance and public safety guardian. Let's hear a lone voice that spoke out from this enormous company. Hey, my name is Kevin Ryan, and I'm formerly a manager at Underwriters Laboratories. I was fired from my job five days after sending a letter to a government scientist at the NIST, questioning the report that the NIST had recently released in October of 2004. I wrote this letter because I had serious questions about what I saw in the report. Those questions went back to September of 2001 when UL CEO came to our location in South Bend. He told our entire staff that the World Trade Center steel had been certified by UL and he said that we should be proud of how long the buildings had stood. Over the next two years I did some research and found some very disturbing facts including that the steel had been disposed of in an unprecedented manner. Once I discovered those facts, I sent a written question to UL CEO asking him about these things and what he was doing to protect our reputation as a company. He replied in writing to me that UL did, in fact, test the steel. He talked about the quality of the sample and how well it had performed in the tests. And he said that our company had tested the steel and that it had done beautifully. After that, he asked me to be patient and wait for the NIST report because UL was working closely with them. I saw this report in October of 2004, and in November, I sent my letter to NIST asking for clarification. I felt it was an obligation on my part to ask the questions, since no one else seemed to care to. After the 1993 bombing, the fireproofing in both buildings was updated considerably. But when you look at the NIST report, you don't see any testing that showed that a 767 would widely dislodge the fireproofing under any impact, let alone so far from the point of impact. 
So now we've been left with a new theory that is not really a theory at all, but only a collection of vague statements. The NIST report represents what can really only be called anti-science. They started with their con 